Now, the term living fossil refers to a creature that was previously thought to be extinct, but then one day a team of scientists come along and they find it just existing in the wild. And that's what this is. This is a living fossil. It is the Nissan Patrol. And no, that wasn't meant to be an insult. It was more of a term of endearment because there have been a few living fossils in the automotive history, like the Mercedes G-Wagon, the Land Rover Defender. These are cars that have stuck around just a bit beyond when you'd expect them to be killed off for a few reasons, mainly because people don't want them to change. And you can sort of lean on the old phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now there are two trims of the current patrol range and this one here is the top spec TIL. It gets all your features and you're looking at over $100,000. Now I'm a big fan of the LED daytime running light design and the LED headlamps. They look quite good and then I am just not a big fan of the different textures of this chrome grille. So we have like a matte finish and then we have this like a reflective finish. I would have liked to see it all as one. Obviously we have a camera below the new Nissan badge here and then down below that it's a kind of radar system for your radar cruise control and safety systems. Now along the side we have 18 inch alloy wheels which are dual tone and they have the new Nissan badge in them. This car's wearing Bridgestone dual or all-terrain tires. We have a vent here with Patrol stamped in there as well but of course we gotta love that V8 badge representing that petrol V8 under the bonnet. Now the side steps here are actually nicely tucked in with the width of the body. They don't really stick out all that much. And also we do have keyless entry and exit by a little button here on the driver and passenger doors. And yeah, there's no adjustable height for the suspension unless you're going aftermarket with that. So at the back, you can see a boot spoiler, a rear wiper, more chrome, another new Nissan badge. And then that's pretty much it. I do like the taillight design. They go very nicely and complement the front ones quite well. And and even for an older car, they've done a good job of keeping the styling feeling pretty fresh thanks to making it not so busy. And then also what I do like is that there's no fake exhaust here. Even despite this packing a properly big engine, there's no attempt to make this car look more sporty than it actually needs to be. But because this has a V8, let's take a listen what it sounds like. <laughs> Now this behemoth does have an automatic tailgate which opens at the press of a button and also you can see those progressive indicators working like that. They look quite cool. What's not cool is that this isn't height adjustable. So if, if you have a low garage roof, it's going to hit the top. Now you're also going to have to renew that gym membership if you haven't got one already because deadlifts are required to be able to get heavy things from sewn down low and all the way up into the boot floor since this isn't height adjustable. But once you get used to that, you have a nice flat boot floor in the rear and some cool aluminium scuff plates as well. Now also you can remove this boot floor to reveal some more storage and then underneath that you just have your simple tools to be able to change a tire because there is a spare tire underneath here. Now there is a 12 volt socket in the rear but you will notice that because this has seven seats it's eating up a lot of that valuable boot space. So to simply fold these down you pull on a tab and they fold down just like that which is pretty useful. Now in the back it is a pretty flat load floor, but the rear seats do act as a bit of a slight incline in the rear. So it may make it a little bit awkward to put items through all the way, but you do have a pretty enormous boot back here. Now credit where credit is due. I was reviewing a Volvo XC90 and I found it very hard to get in the back as an adult, but here I just pull on a tab and the seats tumble forward, making it easy for me to climb into the third row. Now. I've got this side open so you can see what sort of feet room and leg room I've got. I can close this seat in front of me. I can easily fold it back up and yeah, don't really have a whole bunch of space here at all. Now, um, if I had bags behind me, I couldn't really recline my seat, but if I put my headrest up, I'm feeling a bit more comfortable. Can fold the seat back a little bit more. Oh yeah, that's way better. This is what you want to do, but then you have no boot space. So that's the problem. You either have to have comfort or boot space. You're not really going to have both in this car if you want to carry seven people around all the time. I have two cup holders in the back, a pretty nice large window, and my own little air vent back here. So I will say it is pretty comfortable here in the rear for a 5'11 adult. Although this person in the second row might not like me because they have to have their seat a bit more upright rather than having a bit more recline, which they can have if no one's sitting in the back. So easily the best seats in the house are the second row seats. You get your own TV screen, you get your own headphones as well, and you also have your volume controls here in the middle, your own climate controls. You even have your own access to the chilled center console. You've also got a little map pocket here, a nice flat floor all the way through, relatively flat. It's not massive if you want to sit here in the second row to have that transmission and exhaust tunnel. 
underneath your seat. I can be quite comfortable here, although the padding isn't really ideal. You're better off in these outer seats. Now comes for the living fossil statement of this car. You might have been looking at this car going, hey, it's pretty good so far. I don't know why you think it's so old until you look at the interior. This interior really hasn't changed for many years now. And it's a bit disappointing considering that they actually did update this interior, but just not for the Australian market. So let's start from what we're getting from the top down to the bottom. Up top, we have some pretty useful large sunshades, which also have some extensions there, which are very useful. We also do have a small sunroof here, but you can block that out if the sun's getting a bit too much when say you're driving this out in the outback. You've also got an automatic dimming rear mirror, which is very useful. Place to put your sunnies as well. Now we also do have some pretty large Bose speaker grills. Um, so this whole car is fitted with Bose speakers, which do sound relatively good, but they're not mind blowing. And I've, uh, I think something like a Volvo XC90 with their bowels and Wilkins system is honestly some of the best I've ever heard where this Bose system is just pretty good. Now, you've also got this wood trim running around this car. We have leather in this car as well and plenty of real stitching, but this wood trim really does uh, seem a bit out of place in 2022. It feels very old school. It's not like a new school open pore treatment. It's all sort of veneered and it's just, yeah, looking a bit old here in the interior. And then if you want to add insult to injury, this tiny little touchscreen is just uh, like, yeah. I mean, this whole interior is really the best of the 2010s, to be honest. If you want a time machine, Nissan have built it with the current generation Patrol because this screen is just so out of place in 2022. It doesn't even have Apple CarPlay. And when you do hook up your phone to this screen, say if you have an iPhone, it will register your iPhone as an iPod. So yeah, it's okay, it's usable, but to buy a phone cradle to use basic features like um, Google Maps or Apple Maps or anything like that, or if you want to use Android Auto, if we're a hundred thousand dollar car it feels just a little inexcusable if you ask me where apple carplay is pretty easy to have installed and is found on many of nissan's products now below we have our hard buttons for the screen so if you don't feel like touching the screen you can use the hard buttons and because this screen is so laggy it's actually quicker to use these buttons to be honest and then below here we have some media controls you have a cd player trimmed in chrome to really highlight that really highlighting how old this interior is we have some more dials to adjust volume and your climate controls now what i do love is that we have heated and cooled seats up front these are very wide very comfortable very american feeling seats and i do like the little brown sort of trim that we have through the stitching and, and or in the edges of the seat so it looks quite nice and like i mentioned this is a chilled center console we have some areas to store your cups for your cup holders you have another 12 volt socket you do have two usb ports up front and a tiny little area which i could only assume would be an ashtray now this shifter here is pretty old school too but it works quite well and i actually don't mind how this thing looks it's a nice assembly here because you have your drive modes for all your four wheel drive controls and you know your shifter all in one so that looks quite clean now in front of me i have massive analog dials and a very very small digital display now most people will be driving this with their family in a suburban area so let's start there with how this car drives so on the get-go what is really nice to have is all that torque and all that power and all that responsiveness from that naturally aspirated petrol v8 now look on paper not very good uh, on fuel and it's one of those things that you really don't want to be driving with compared to say something like a turbo diesel v6 because you're just going to be chewing through a lot of fuel but this does have a very large fuel tank and so if you're careful with how you are on your throttle you can actually make this thing be relatively economic compared to um, a petrol v6 for example and that's where i think this v8 really even though it has two extra cylinders it's really no too different from um, a thirstier twin turbo v6 um, depends how you drive it though obviously if you get a bit more um, enthusiastic with the throttle and different story. Now visibility, this car has a really good visibility. I can see out through the entire cabin, really easy to park, especially with that 360 degree camera, but I didn't really find myself having to use it all that much thanks to the big mirrors and big windows. Now the sound of the engine is actually very isolated from the cabin, so it may sound like a beastly thing, but it sounds nothing like um, a cheap Grand Cherokee SRT, for example. Now steering is very light. It's so light that just anyone having a go at driving this thing, if you're learning to drive on this thing, anything like that you're going to have an absolute fine time getting used to it and so yeah really easy to use but if you want a bit of a more sporty drive there's no way to adjust the steering feel and unfortunately that just makes it just a little bit lackluster through corners um, even though it feels pretty capable so along a bit of road like this the suspension's really quite cushiony and you can go over 
pretty sizable potholes and bumps and you're not really going to feel it. So it just feels like it's sort of coasting above the ground. I really like that feeling quite a lot, and especially sitting this high up, you can see well ahead of you of what's coming up. Now the gearbox is pretty slick. It's a pretty old one too, but it does the job just fine. It doesn't really do anything surprising and it's not very responsive either if you want to change your own gears. It's really, you know, if you want to go down a couple of years, and <laughs> V8's so much fun to engage with though, like, and it get, like, listen to that, like. So it is fun to shift your own gears in this car, which I would normally say isn't in a car like this, but it's pretty responsive actually. I take that back. It didn't really feel like it was going to, but it does shift relatively quick down, but on the up, yeah, not so much. Nissan is scared to move on and disrupt um, what they have here. And a lot of brands have chosen to either go upmarket with cars like this. So Land Rover did that with the Defender and it paid off for them. Um, Mercedes obviously did, did it with the G-Wagon. And then Toyota and Nissan are left with the Land Cruiser and the Patrol sitting here going, well, what should we do? Should we make them radically different? Should we, I reckon there's a lot of debate going on in the background, what should happen to this car? Hence why we see it sort of stagnant in its progress and updates. But um, the people who do appreciate a car that's got tried and tested technology because this technology is so old, um, yeah, you can still buy this. And I think that's part of the appeal of this car. Although I will say a lack of active. 200 meters, there is a speed camera. Also, it does that. It announces speed cameras in a very awkward and loud and interrupting way. But then what I would have also liked to see is active steering assist in this car, especially for cars designed to go through and cover long distances on long stretches of highways. It just would have made driving just a little bit easier. Now, this is actually my first time testing the Nissan Patrol off-road. The first one I did, I could only test it purely on-road due to uh, pandemic circumstances. So. Let's see what we've got here on an off-road proving ground. So I've got a little off-road sort of menu to pick from. I've got automatic, which jumps between four high and four low. I've got some drive modes for sand, snow, rock, and on road. I've got hill descent control, a rear diff locker, and I can turn traction control off. I've turned it on for sand because that's sort of the similar uh, terrain we're on right now. It's like loose rock and dirt and it's a bit sandy. So let's get going. Now let's try and activate hill descent control. It's just blinking at me, so I'm just sort of curious what's going on. Usually when I press hill descent control, it automatically engages. So I wonder if I go into park and then I go into drive. It's still blinking. Okay. So just a little bit odd, to be honest. Um, not as easy to use. If there's a trick here they've got to do to hold it down. I mean, I always go into these car tests trying to do it like as if you know i've just jumped in which i usually have and just for hill descent control not to work at the press of a button like it does on other cars is just a little disappointing if there's a way to set it no cruise on no just blinking so um yes uh hill descent control is just being a bit finicky but in terms of its composure out here on this track, it's just next level. So um, some of the best off-roaders I've tested would be the Land Rover Defender and the Ford Ranger Raptor. Those things just cruise and make mincemeat out of any off-road track you go on. And to be honest, that's sort of what the patrol is doing here right now. Without adjusting any air pressure in this car, I can just turn off the road and see what these Bridgestone tires have got to offer us. So we have some ruts here that I'll just sort of carefully make my way over. Now, the thing is that, that sidestep, I'm just a bit worried about. This does have a long wheelbase, so I'm just being a little bit careful going into some ruts because you don't want, you don't want to lose your sidesteps. And yeah, look, driving through here, it's very composed. I really think this car is obviously deserving of its legendary status. And that's part of the reason why, again, people like driving this thing. It just feels so planted, so solid. And I really don't have to worry about any sort of approach or departure angles on these sorts of tracks. This is a bit uh, more tough than some normal cars would like to go on. So for some of my Subarus that I test and all that sort of stuff, they don't really like going up this trail. But here, <laughs> Patrol is just making mince and heat of it. Now you're sitting there wondering, if I had $100,000 lying around, or if you do, should I go out and get a Nissan Patrol before they change it up for possibly a new model? Well, I would say it's a good base. So if you're looking for the best tech and all that sort of stuff, 
this car really isn't the go. If you want to already spend $100,000 on an off-roading SUV, then something like the Land Rover Defender is a great place to go. Now, I haven't tested the new Toyota Land Cruiser, so I can't comment on whether that's worth buying or not, but I definitely do recommend going and checking out the Land Rover Defender for the price that starts at. In addition, if you really like off-roading and you kind of like, yes, more tech, but you don't really care what body style you get, then the Ford Ranger Raptor was the best off-roading vehicle I've tested this year. So where does that leave this? Well, like I said, it's a good starting place. So if you want to modify, add heaps of bits and pieces to your car, then the Nissan Patrol is still a good way to go. But I could just say, if you're watching Nissan, this is the car that you've already got mostly right. You just got to tweak it a little bit more. Now, thank you so much for watching this review. I really appreciate you dropping by and checking it out. If you have anything to say, let me know in the comments down below. I'll reply to you down there. If you like this review, like it. If you didn't like it, dislike it. And let me know what you want to see on our channel. Thank you so much for watching. My name's Cameron. This is Product Review Cars. I'll see you on the next one.